Hi, this is Faderport from Personas. It's a controller designed to work with multiple DAWs, and its main differentiating feature compared to regular MIDI controllers is these motorized faders, which may initially sound like a gimmick, but is actually quite a transformative experience when using a DAW like an instrument rather than just software. Let's check it out. Personas is a company that makes audio products like mixing consoles, audio interfaces, and monitors, and they also make the DAW Studio One. When I reached out and offered that I check out Fader Port 8, I said that I'm an Ableton Live user, and they said that they had recently improved their support for Live, so I was happy to check it out. But note that aside from sending this over, this review, like all my reviews, are not paid, and this content is entirely my opinion. Fader Port 8, by the way, also officially supports Pro Tools, Logic, Cubase, Cakewalk, Sonar, and of course, Studio One, and may work well with other DAWs using the HUI or MCU standards. Like I said, I'll be focusing on the integration with Ableton Live. Now, one important thing to note out the gate, the integration with Live is based on the MCU, the Mackie Control standard, which means that it's not as tight as integration as could potentially be possible using a dedicated Ableton Live script. We'll look at some of these limitations in this video. Let's take a look at the hardware overall. The stars of the show, of course, are these eight motorized faders. They have a travel distance of 10 centimeters, close to four inches, which is quite a lot and gives you a good detailed control of parameters. The enclosure is solid metal and sits nice and stable on your table and the buttons respond well. The two encoders are click encoders, which is a good thing because it gives you a nice satisfying click for every parameter that you move forward or backward. The little screens on top are backlit, but they're LCDs, not OLEDs, which means that front and center is the best viewing angle. If you plan to rely on the screens, you'll want to place fader port as close as possible uh, to right in front of you rather than way on to the side. Finally, on the hardware side, you've got a foot switch input on the back to control transport and fader port does need to be powered. It comes with a powered supply and it connects to your computer via USB. Let's take a look at what the faders do. Generally speaking, they control one of four parameters. Track levels, so you can see that correspond over here. Track sends, right, up to eight sends. Panning, here is center, and you can go left and right on a per track basis. And they can also edit plugin parameters, more on this later. When you move a fader, its on-screen counterpart will move, and more importantly, because it's motorized, if I go ahead and move this parameter, the fader will move as well. The faders also respond to pre-recorded automation, so you'll see these motions here. More on that later. Let's take a look at some of the other controls. Track is sort of like the home page where faders control track volume levels. The displays will show you track names, emitting vowels here and then, but giving you a good idea of what's going on and which channel you're controlling. When you're in track mode, these little bar graphs show you panning and you can control the panning for the active track using this knob. And when you go into pan mode, then this shows you track levels and you can control track levels with this uh, encoder. As you may have seen before, if you have more than eight tracks in your project, when you press the channel button, you can move between the tracks just like this with this encoder. One small thing to note, when in track mode, like I mentioned before, these faders control track levels, zero dB, on live is at around 4 dB on the display here. I spoke with Personas, they might change this in the future, but for now you just have to get used to zero being at around 4 over here. Regardless of the different track modes, you can always control mutes or solos over here, and you've got buttons to clear solos or clear mutes. Arm works pretty nicely as well. Typically the selected tracks are green, and when you hit arm, you just arm the tracks you want. You can also shift and arm all. This arms all the tracks in the current bank. So as I shift to the next bank, I'd need to rearm those tracks as well. And by the way, this track didn't get armed because it's a group. Finally, for overall track controls, if you hit bypass, you have access to the four return tracks. Transport control is pretty straightforward. Stop, play, and record mirror the same functions on live. Double tapping stop goes back to zero. Hitting play will start your track. You can toggle, by the way, between arranger and session view here. Then, you know, pressing play again goes back to the play spot. Again, stop, and then double tap to go to the start. 
and record will again behave just as it does when you press this button. Let's take a look at the control section. The buttons on the bottom determine the function of the encoder and the navigation buttons. These are mainly oriented towards Live's arrangement mode, but many of the functions work in session view as well. We already covered how Channel lets you move through the tracks one by one. You can use the buttons as well. And then uh, Bank lets you do that in groups of eight with the buttons as well. Click and section are tied to punch in and punch out and they also reflect their status. And then zoom and scroll lets you, as you would expect, zoom in and out into your timeline and scroll across it. Finally, for the control section, marker lets you set markers by pressing the encoder in, right, just like this. And then you can move between the markers using these navigation buttons. Holding shift and then any one of these session buttons, by the way, sends out MIDI notes so you could potentially map that to whatever you want. Next up, Personas calls this the automation control section though for uh, live. You can't really control the automation here. It's more of just generic functions. You've got trim and off are actually redo and undo. So if I wanted to undo these marker points, I could do that quickly or redo them if I wanted. And then read enables and disables follow on live right enables draw mode and touch enables back to arrangement if your tracks were active in the session. So it's sort of like an eclectic bunch of controls here. It would certainly be nice to see this expanded to include more live functions like session record, for example, and these buttons don't have secondary functions with shift. It would be nice to see that expanded here as well. A few more miscellaneous controls, holding shift and track turns on timecode here, right? so you can See the timecode display here if you liked. The audio button toggles session and arrangement views. VI toggles clip and device views. Bus toggles your browser and VCA toggles the detail view. Now, as you saw, there's no real way to know what these buttons do by what's printed on them because Faderport was designed with Studio One in mind. But after a few hours of use, you sort of just remember these by heart. Obviously, it would have been nice if this shipped with an overlay for the various DAWs Faderport supports with labels for what they actually do outside of Studio One. Okay, so let's talk about editing device or plugin parameters, which is one of my favorite things about Faderport 8. To edit the devices of a particular track, you first want to make sure that that track is selected and active. So choose the track you want and then hit edit plugins. And you'll see up here on the screen the names of the devices that are down here in your track. And then you just simply select the device that you want to edit. So let's say I want to mess around with this guy. Now you saw the faders jump to the position that's reflected on screen. And now if I change a parameter here, it will also change the parameter in the instrument. This is Jasmine, which just plays notes as per the position of this knob. And of course, if I change the parameter on screen, the fader will move as well, typical. Now, one little quirk here, and I asked Personas about this and they mentioned it's a bug that they're planning to fix. You can't see the parameter names on screen now, but you can if you touch the faders. So you don't need to move them, but the minute you just touch one, you'll see the parameter, the name of the parameter that it controls uh, on screen. Again, ideally it wouldn't disappear and they're working on fixing that, which I guess is a good as time as any to mention that the faders are indeed touch sensitive and you can actually calibrate that in the settings. Now you can use the faders to automate parameters and you can also use them as a visual aid to reflect the way that parameters behave. So for example, in this clip, I have automation right, in the instrument rack to the pitch. Which plays the notes, right? And you can see these move in tandem. I've got two automation tracks here. This is the rate automation. And you'll see that move when it gets to the section which automates it. Right, so no ghosts in the studio. It just follows the automation in the track. If you want to control a different plugin, Ideally, you'd press these buttons. Currently, you need to uh, press Edit Plugins and then choose it. So let's say I choose Chorus. Again, you can't see the parameters here yet. It's a bug they're going to fix. But if you touch a fader, you can see the parameter names. So if I wanted to add Chorus, I know that this is the, uh, the fader I need to move. 
go back to edit plugins, I could choose a different one. Uh, this is a third party plugin. You can see its parameters reflected here. Which actually brings me to a good point. What happens if a plugin has more than eight parameters? So if we check out, for example, uh, this is the Comet Reverb, but let's just start with a fresh plugin. I'll bring up the browser and let's say, for example, choose Echo. Right, so now by default, if I go to edit Echo, you'll see that the parameters that I can control aren't necessarily the ones that I wanna have control over. Now we can work around this limitation of seeing only the first eight parameters by putting this into a group and then mapping the parameters that we want to control to macros. So for example, I definitely want to control the rates and feedback. And then let's add, let's say reverb and the dry wet level. And notice the name I have here is the same thing that we have here. I want something more indicative of what this does so I can rename this. And now I have control of the parameters that I want in the delay. So I can mess around with these. Obviously, I need to bring in dry web. You get the idea. Of course, any automation to these parameters can be recorded with the faders and will be played back on them as well. So that's how you control mappings for Ableton plugins. You can also do the same thing for third-party plugins that have a lot of parameters. So for example, I'm using in this little track, uh, Straylight from Native Instruments. Let's just get this going. Right, so I've already pre-mapped four parameters here. If I go into the track, right, and edit plugins, I can choose it and then control these parameters. You can see I have an automation here. Let's maybe take a look at that. Over here. Right. So this automation, right, these little, these little bends are over here, and I can control the various levels. Um, if you want to see this thing, right? So these are the parameters. This is being automated. These are parameters that I have control over inside this plugin. These are just main controls of the preset that you can mess around with. Really nice one, by the way, if you want to check it out. Now, I mapped these four parameters to these faders. Of course, you, if you want to map additional ones, you just go into configure. And then as you tap a plugin parameter, let's say the cursor position here, it will appear, just move this a bit, right here. Let's say I want to automate uh, this as well. You can see the faders move to reflect the, uh, the position of the parameters that I'm adding. Again, up to eight parameters can be controlled through the faders, at least currently. One last thing that's useful to know about fader port, it also has a MIDI mode. Now, currently, if you want to get into MIDI mode, you need to turn it off, turn it on while pressing these two buttons. Then you get into a menu with various items you can control. So this is where I would select, for example, the different DAW that I want to use. But if I go back to the main menu, I can turn on MIDI mode. And then if I were to activate this, then this would act like a MIDI controller. The faders and buttons have their own CCs. You can't change those, so you'll need to learn them in your software. I think it would have been nice to have MIDI mode accessible without you having to turn fader port on or off. This sort of puts MIDI a little bit further away from you in terms of day-to-day -day use, but frankly, it's not that necessary con considering how well the different parameters adapt to what you're doing with fader port and your DAW. Let's talk about pros and cons. On the cons side, Fader Port 8 wasn't built from the ground up to support Ableton Live, which means you have to put up with some quirks. On the hardware side, there are things that won't change, like the button labels not matching their function in Live. And on the software side, some things may change depending on the capabilities of the MCU protocol that Live and Fader Port use to talk to each other. For example, the limit to eight devices per track or eight parameters per device like I showed you before, you can sort of get around that a bit using groups or racks in live. 
One thing I'd like to see is a quicker swap between the DAW and MIDI modes that would make that more seamless and useful. On the pro side, the way Fader Port 8 and Live work together is quite impressive. I personally prefer faders to knobs because you can control more than one parameter at a time with one hand, and the motorized faders aren't a gimmick. Working with Live and Fader Port 8 as a companion is a big improvement to the workflow. If you have a chance, I highly recommend checking out. And while you're checking out things, if you want to support this channel, please check out my book about synth and DAW's ideas, tips, and tricks available to people who support this channel on Patreon. Ring the notification bell after subscribing if you want to make sure you don't miss the next one. Hit like if this was useful. And if you have any questions, hit me up in the comments section below. Thanks for watching.